right. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing today, and it will be available to you watch at your convenience later. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our show archives. Uh, both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So um, please share uh, with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone who you think might be interested in our show. Uh, for those of you who might not be from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries, um, similar to your state library. So we provide um, services to all types of libraries in the state. So you'll find shows on Encompass Live for all types of libraries, uh, public, academic, K-12, corrections, museums, archives, um, anything and everything. Really, our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries. Um, we have book reviews, interviews, uh, mini training sessions, demos of services and products, all sorts of things. Um, we bring in guest speakers sometimes from across the country and even sometimes outside of the United States. Um, but we also have Nebraska Library Commission staff that do presentations for us. And that's what we have today. Uh, joining us this morning is Gabe Kramer. Good morning, Gabe. Good morning. And he is our director of our Talking Book and Braille service here based out of the Nebraska Library Commission. And he's going to talk about um, all the awesome things they drew through TBBS, right? No pressure. Yeah, yeah. So I'll hand it over <laughs> to you to tell us all about it. Sure, yeah. So we're just going to kind of go about, uh, talk about the past, present, and future of the Talking Book and Braille service. Um, as Krista said, I am Gabe Kramer, the director of the Talking Book and Braille service. Just a little bit about myself. I've been with the commission for almost 13 years. Mm -hmm. I received my master's in library science from the University of, of Missouri back in 2017. No, 2018. 2018. Uh -huh. And I have been director since June of 19. So my first. Uh, year or so was quite the experience. Not only was I hiring uh, two or three people within the first six months, but uh, then we got shut down because of the pandemic. So right. it, it was a, a big learning curve for me. Thrown right into the deep end, no problem. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But today I wanna to talk about, you know, where we started as a Talking Books program, where we are currently and where we hope to be in the future. Um, so let's just jump right in. Everything with the Talking Book and Braille Service goes back to actually the National Library Service, which is part of the Library of Congress. The foundation for Talking Books lies in the Pratt Smoot Act of 1931 provided for the Library of Congress to provide books to people who are blind and to work with regional libraries for book circulation. The Talking Book and Braille Service, or TBBS, is the regional library for Nebraska. And in 1996, Congress passed the Chafee Amendment, which addresses copyright and allows for the reproduction of materials in specialized format, which we will get to in a bit, for the exclusive use by individuals with visual and physical disabilities. Um, we've always been able to record materials in our studios, but the Chafee Amendment just made it law. The National Library Service, NLS, is a division of the Library of Congress. Through a national network of cooperating libraries, which the Talking Book and Braille Service is one, NLS administers a free library program of Braille and audio materials circulated to eligible borrowers in the United States by postage free mail. The collection includes audio and Braille books and magazines, music stores in Braille and large print, and specially designed playback equipment. These materials are available for residents of the United States 
who are unable to read or use standard print materials because of visual or physical impairment. NLS administers the program nationally while direct service to eligible individuals and institutions is the responsibility of cooperating libraries in the various states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Virgin Islands. Service is also extended to eligible American citizens residing abroad. The Talking Book and Braille Service is the NLS network library serving the state of Nebraska. TBBS provides free books and magazines on cartridge through download via Braille and audio reading download. So the Braille and audio reading download we'd like to call BARD, B-A-R-D. And in Braille to individuals with a physical or visual condition or reading disability, which limits use of regular print. Uh, you must meet NLS requirements to qualify for service though. So a little history of the technology. As I said before, everything has to be recorded in a specialized format. And that is because we don't need copyright permission to record written materials. So, Back in the 1930s, when the National Library Service first started, talking books were recorded on 33 and a third RPM records. Back then, the industry standard was 78 RPM. Then in the late 40s and into the 50s, 33 and a third became the industry standard. So the National Library Service said, well, this is no longer special. They ended up going to 16 and a third and eventually eight and a third RPM to get more audio on each record and to be proprietary protected format. Um, if you can imagine eight revolutions per minute, that's really slow. Mm -hmm. But the slower a record turns on your turntable, the more audio you can fit on each side. So they didn't have to ship out as many records to patrons when they wanted books. Eventually they went to cassettes but again, to be a specialized format, they went to four track cassettes. So your normal cassettes that you had when you were a kid had two sides. These have four sides. And what they did was took your A side of a cassette and cut it in half the long way. If you can imagine a line going through the middle of it, and that was side one and side three. Then you'd flip it over for side two and side four. It also was recorded at one and seven, seven eighths or half speed. So you could get 88 minutes per side. That means a cassette could hold almost six hours on it. Wow. And then where we I are now. That's could have held that much music. <laughs> oh, I know. Think of how many mixtapes you could have made. <laughs> <laughs> so much easier. <laughs> Um, now we're in the digital age, of course. We skipped CDs. So cassettes lasted until roughly 2012. And now we've gone digital to our digital talking books. And it's just a set of audio files and navigation files, which are encrypted for copyright protection and limited in size only by storage capacity of the um, cartridge that they're on. So that's the original A77, well, not the original machine, but the most popular machine, uh, record player. This is the C1 cassette player. This was the longest in-use machine in NLS history. It lasted from 1981 to 2012, officially. Mm -hmm. Although it is still in use today, we have somewhere between five and eight patrons that still have one of these. Um, all of the materials that they can get for the C1 machines are limited to the roughly 500 titles that we still have on cassette, and that is it. And if, when your machine breaks or the battery dies, it, it's a dead machine. It's obsolete. We cannot fix it, replace it, uh, mm -hmm. put a new battery in it, nothing. It is, it is done. So a little bit about our recording process. We have about 25 volunteer narrators that read anywhere from 90 minutes to two hours a week. 
all narrators must go through an audition process before they can become narrators. Um, everyone goes through the same audition process. It takes about 45 minutes or so. And because we're quite picky, about 70% of everyone that auditions does not pass the audition. Uh, we really are looking for the best that we can that we can get. Within our studios, we mainly focus on magazines. We record about 25 unique titles. The magazines are of local and regional interest. And because of timeliness, we use multiple narrators per issue. This allows us to get the magazines out as fast as possible. Now, books take more time. They take anywhere from six to 18 months from the time we start recording them to the time they are ready for public consumption. And that is one voice per book. Uh -huh. Because those are permanent, we want them to sound the, the best that they possibly can. After the recording is finished, magazines go through what we call the assembly process. So even though we record in digital, not in analog, we still think about things through an analog lens. So during the recording process, each article is recorded as its own standalone file. And this is for magazines, not, not books, of course. Then they are assembled into what we call a side. Each side is 88 minutes long. Um, if an article, if we're in the middle of an article, once we hit that 88 minute mark, we'll just start side two or side three or whatever we're on. And a lot of this has to do with file size. Uh, we, we've noticed that when files get larger than about 88 minutes or, or 90 minutes, um, we find a lot more errors and computer glitches that can happen. Hmm. And when we upload the files to the BARD website, they also like to have the 90 minute file sizes because it's just easier to transfer these smaller files than one long 30 hour file. After the magazine is assembled, they go to our post-production where the audio is cleaned up. After post-production is what we call markup. For markup, we use a program called Hindenburg. It is a proprietary software developed just for us. And if you think of markup, that's where we insert the markers that allow you to skip between articles or chapters or parts. So if you're listening to an audiobook, Markup is, um, we insert the markers that allow you to skip from chapter to chapter. Then we move to the encryption process. After encryption, the recording is essentially locked. The only way to listen to the recording is to insert the cartridge into one of our digital talking book machines or DTBMs. If you were to place the cartridge into the USB port on your computer, you would receive a message that you are not authorized to view this file. Hmm. Um, so if you think of the machines as having a key the, and the key is built in that unlocks the encrypted cartridge, books go through an extra step before they go to post-production and then we call it review. One of my colleagues sits and listens to the recording with a copy of the book and finds everything that we did wrong in the studio, extraneous noises, mispronounced words, or wrong words. Then we send the book back to the studio to be fixed. After fixes, books continue down the same path as magazines. So this could be anything as major as, you know, literal pages missing, which we have done before or something as small as um, if it's the boy jumped in the pool and you say a boy, we'll go back and fix that. Yeah. We strive for perfection on everything we do, but books I really believe, excuse me, are about 99% accurate. Uh, magazines are probably more like 95% accurate. Mm -hmm. So we have two types of circulation models within the Talking Book and Braille service, and there are pros and cons to both physical and digital. 
The pros to physical materials is their accessibility. They are stored on physical media on shelves. However, physical media must be inspected and reshelved. The pros for digital files, they can be circulated through traditional means such as cartridges, but they don't have to be stored and reshelved. Additional methods are also possible, such as BARD, which allows patrons to download books straight to their mobile device. But digital files can become corrupted, access can be cut off if the internet is down, or if you don't have Wi-Fi at home. So now we're up to the digital cartridges. Digital books were initially made to circulate on special, specialized shape flash memory cartridges. They're about the size of a credit card. Each cartridge used to hold one book or one magazine title. The labels identified its stable contents. You know, if it was The Great Gatsby, the label on it said The Great Gatsby. Digital had better sound, better storage capacity. You could navigate easier. You could just skip from chapter to chapter instead of rewinding or fast forwarding. There are two models of digital talking book players available to patrons. We call them the standard and advanced player. Standard and advanced, as you see the pictures there. The advanced machine just has one more row of buttons. There are five extra buttons on the advanced player. Um, prior to duplication on demand, which I will talk about in just a minute here, the standard player worked just as well as the advanced player. I feel that with duplication on demand and the fact that we are now able to put multiple titles on a cartridge, the advanced player is actually easier to use. But most patrons do not like the advanced player. They're intimidated simply because it has more buttons on it. Hmm. Um, sure. Bard is our downloadable web page that patrons can go to and download books to their smart device so as the slide says it is the national library service download website books and magazines produced by nls can be downloaded to a computer unzipped and copied to a blank cartridge and used on one of our players or you can download it straight to your mobile device and let me go back. When you are downloading to a computer, that is Windows only. Um, they call that BART Express, and it does not work for Apple computers. This is the main page of the BART website. It's very simple, and that's to make it easier for our visu visually impaired patrons to use screen readers. Um, when you get too many graphics or or just too much clutter, the screen readers can't not uh, read the page as easy. So this is our mobile app. Apps are available for iOS and Android devices. Nice. Borrowers can find and download their books to play directly on these devices using their barred login and password. For those who have their own mobile device, like the Kindle Fire or an iPad or a phone or anything, they don't have to load multiple machines around. They can just download straight to the machine. No cartridge or, or talking book machine is required. This is a picture of what the app looks like. If you can recall from a few slides, slides back, the app and the machines look almost identical. And that was, of course, done on purpose. So people that were used to the machines could use the app as, as easily as possible. So now we're up to the present day, which is duplication on demand. Now, what is duplication on demand? Well, it combines the home delivered cartridge and BARD together. It essentially functions as a modified version of the digital talking book cartridge distribution model, but incorporates some of the advantages of the downloadable models as well. Cartridges are still delivered to patrons via mail, and they still play on the standard and advanced players, but now we can put multiple books and or magazines on cartridge. 
That's a picture of what our system looks like. Whoa. Um, That's yeah, a lot all of work being done all at one. once. <laughs> yeah, we were able to uh, create 20 cartridges at, at a time, and each of those cartridges is for one patron. Everything is created just for them. So, uh, duplication on demand in a nutshell. So, when a patron requests a book, either through the truly on demand process, such as contacting their reader's advisor and asking for a specific title, or through the automatic fulfillment process or turnaround, um, these are all different uh, ways that you can have a cartridge created for you. For you. It requires a patron or a reader's advisor to create a request list within our ILS system, which we call Web Reads. And then a cartridge will be created specifically for that patron. So Web Reads sends the books to the stack on the right here. Each cartridge corresponds to a box on the monitor. So when the cartridge is finished duplicating, we scan the barcode, which is located on the back of the cartridge, and a mail card is printed. It's about the size of a postcard. We put the cartridge in a, in a box, put the mail card on the outside of the box, put it in the mail. It's done. And if a patron keeps their request list updated, the automatic fulfillment or turnaround process is great. So when a cartridge is returned, a new one is sent immediately with books off of their personal request list. So the duplication on demand, you do it for people based on what they've requested. It's that is correct, but it's it's mostly automated. Hmm. So if a patron uh, calls their reader's advisor and says, I want, uh, I just want Westerns. We'll create a request list with, say, 100 Western titles, and we'll create a cartridge. Their first cartridge might have five books on it that are all Westerns. We'll send it to them in the mail. When they return that cartridge, when we check the uh, previous cartridge in, the duplication on demand system will automatically find that patron's file and just pull the next five books off the request list and create another cartridge for them. Nice. So advantages for patrons, they can receive multiple books on a cartridge if they prefer. There's less fussing with mail delivery and return, just less items coming to them in the mail. No waiting for books. There's an infinite copy or infinite number of copies of books. So prior to October of 2018, when we switch to duplication on demand, um, we would get the new Stephen King book and we might have five titles or five copies of that title. If those are all checked out, just like at any public library, you, ha you have to have a waiting list. Mm -hmm. With duplication on demand, we no longer have a waiting list. We have an infinite number of copies of books. So for the one book, one Nebraska, for example, if oh, yeah every single one of our patrons wanted to read that book at the same time they could um another advantage for patrons is reading books in series in actual series order on a single cartridge again when we had physical copies sitting on our shelves prior to dod if you read the first uh harry potter book and you wanted the second book and it was all checked out, you could skip and read it the third if you wanted. Well, now we can just put all seven in the correct order on a cartridge for you. There's fewer cartridges to keep track of around the house. Um, and new titles produced by NLS can be borrowed immediately, and that really is a big deal. Um, it used to be that you would have to wait not only for NLS to record the, the national titles, um, you know, your, your New York Times bestsellers, which could be delayed because recording takes time, but also they had to get mailed to us and who knows how long they could be at the post office or be in transit. And mm -hmm. then we have to process them, put barcodes on them. So it could be weeks, if not maybe a month or two before patrons could actually access the old physical titles. With DOD, it's immediate. Without electronic copies, it's all just on the computers. Yeah, digital. That's correct. Yep. Yeah. 
So, so this is interesting. Uh, a, a question someone's asking here about because uh, you know many librarians deal with ebooks and the whole ebook model that um, some publishers or providers limit the number of copies you can have, and it's it's, it's a huge uh, problem, issue, controversy. Why does it matter if it's digital? Just make as many as people need. And you all don't have that issue. That obviously that's because of how NLS or has been set up with the the original acts. I assume that you yes. don't have to worry about any of those kind of concerns with publishers. Because we don't need copyright permission to record the books, we essentially have carte blanche to do whatever we want with them as long as they are in a protected format. Ah, the format. That's why that's the special format. Correct. Yes. Got it. Got and it. One big game changer besides DOD um, happened, I want to say it was roughly 2016. Um, prior to 2016, either the local uh, regional network libraries, such as Nebraska, we had to record our books, or NLS, had to record books so even if it was a a national title you know the the newest uh john grisham book mm -hmm. and the publisher made an audio copy of said book we were not allowed to use that specific recording you had to make your own we had to make our own yeah. um in 2016 a deal was made between the library of congress and the big four publishers to uh, have access to those national recordings. So now a lot of the big books, you know, your, your New York Times bestsellers, um, you know, any of, of the major audiobooks that Barnes & Noble is selling or that is on the shelves of your, of your local library, we now have access to those exact recordings. So now the National Library Service can focus on more of those secondary titles. Mm -hmm. um, so again, prior to 2016, the National Library Service was only able to record roughly 3,000 titles a year. Well, now they're still recording those 3,000 titles a year, but we have access to an additional roughly 3,000 titles that are given to us by the book publishers. The publishers themselves, so nice. We, we've doubled the amount of books new books per year for our patrons. Um, but yeah, the key is the specialized format. Mm -hmm. um, this is just uh, creating a series on a cartridge. We already kind of discussed that. Advantages for staff when it comes to du duplication on demand. Again, every book is always available for anyone delivered just in time. Less storage space is needed for book copies. And in fact, uh, on the next slide, there's gonna be a picture of our stacks full of these blue boxes. Oh yeah. Now imagine those stacks being completely empty, which is what they are now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there's less staff time pulling shelf books for the outgoing mail, inspecting return books, testing the old cartridges, or in the old days, having to rewind the cassettes. Um, and the, we no longer have to reshelf books. And there's just less overall mail volume now. Um, if we're putting an average of three book titles per cartridge, our mail has been cut by two thirds. Um, although I will admit, I kind of miss pulling books in the morning. That was the first job I had when I started here was in the circulation department. Mm -hmm. I love being able to get here at eight in the morning and I could have my coffee and put my headphones on and listen to music or whatever and just roam the stacks and pulling, you know, it was you know about three or 400 books a day for patrons. It would take me the first hour and a half or two hours in the morning. You can ease into your day. Well, that's no longer the case anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but I, did, I did I do truly miss that that job <laughs> so here's the uh, or what our stacks used to look like prior to uh, September of 2019 
So in 2000, September of 2019, we officially got rid of all of those blue boxes. Right. They, they are gone. a huge project. I remember that. <laughs> yes, it took, I want to say it was like nine months to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so during the transition phase, some of our patrons were receiving books via duplication on demand, which is the card on the left with the uh, looks like white. They're actually translucent boxes, but the white boxes. While some others were still receiving the books via our old physical circulation method, the card on the left created via DOD. Um, I guess I already said that. But what's great is in this photo was since this photo was taken, the amount of books on the left has not grown. That's pretty much our outgoing mail every day of the week now. Where in the old days, we might have four of those cards completely full with outgoing books every single day. Um, we are now average, averaging about three to three and a half titles per cartridge. So, Dan, as I said before, um, our outgoing mail um, has been cut by two thirds. If everyone is getting three books on an individual cartridge, that's less that we have to send out every day. That's less that is clogging up their mailbox. Nice budget saver too for us, I assume. Well, I mean, if you think of it in like staff time, uh, we can devote staff time to other things, but you know, all of those, those books, they didn't cost us any money. So right. they were given to us by the National Library Service, which is why we had to then send everything back to the National Library Service. Right, send all those blue boxes back, yes. Yes. <laughs> um, so we began transitioning patrons to duplication on demand October 25th of 2018. Our initial uh, plan was to phase the transition over anywhere from like a three to a six month period. We ended up having all of our patrons switched by the end of the year. Um, we decided to just rip the bandaid off. It was a lot easier than slow playing it. As of the end of September, 2019, we have sent out almost 75,000 duplication on demand cartridges that have contained almost 230,000 individual books or titles. And that averages to 3.1 books per cartridge. Our traditional mail card based deliveries drop to about one every two weeks. We do still send out some uh, old VHS tapes that have descriptive video on them. Um, we have a few DVDs, but not, not many. We do still send out the occasional cassette because as I said before, we have like five to eight patrons that still have the old cassette player. Mm -hmm. um, so those are not duplication on demand. We have to use our old mail cards for that. 50% of our patrons were responsible for 95% of our actual circulation and that still holds true today. And Almost all of our patrons love the change to du duplication on demand. Um, they just like having more books on one cartridge. So that's a picture of our current cartridges and the mail cards. As you can see on the mail cards, it has your name and address on one side and on the other side, it has a list of the books that are on the cartridge as well. In the future, currently duplication on demand, it, it kind of supports magazine materials. We still circulate magazines the old way, which is one issue of a magazine per cartridge. However, the national magazine program is that is produced by National Audio Company, they are shipped with multiple titles per cartridge. So you might get a cartridge with a uh, Sports Illustrated and the current issue of Time and the current issue of People, all on it. We now have access as of February of this year to the Braille e-readers. Um, our Braille readership has 
gone up almost 500 percent wow since february so um, how do braille e-readers work so <laughs> that's actually a really good question because i still have not been able to get my hands on one ah. i am we'll say arguing with nls <laughs> <laughs> if it's something your patrons are going to be using, you think you should be able to have at least a knowledge of what the hell works for them. So what has happened is Utah uh, Talking Book Service, which is based out of Salt Lake City, they are running the Braille e-reader program for a few of the states in this part of the country. Uh, New Mexico is one, Nebraska, Wyoming. Um, Alaska, I want to say Montana maybe. So it's the smaller states, mm. uh, population-wise anyway. Sure. I don't know why this is the case because we distribute the talking book, the audio talking book machines, but mm. that's just how they set it up. I was not privy to any of the uh, negotiations or conversations that that set this up. Um, I think that's going to be short term, you know, probably for the first year or so of the of the Braille e-reader program, and then we kind of will like a pilot project or no, the pilot is done. Oh, well, there they did that. Oh, all right. Yes, the pilot went on for it was almost two years. Mm. Um, now they are rolling it out to the states, and in fact, um, I think it's California doesn't even have access to the e-readers yet. No. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that has to do with, of course, supply chain issues. Yeah. Um, they just can't get their hands on the the either the machines as a whole or humanware who creates the machines can't get their hands on parts to make the machines. Yeah. Then um, I don't know how many um, public libraries have either heard about or used the Marrakesh Treaty. But the U.S. joined the treaty as its 50th member, allowing NLS to assist patrons in requesting accessible materials in a wide range of languages from other libraries around the world that are also treaty members. I don't really believe it's created any more interest locally here in Nebraska for foreign language materials, mm -hmm. um, unless you count materials from England as foreign language, but it's still English. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I really think the treaty is going to help out talking book libraries in less developed countries have access to our materials. Um, and then wireless delivery, the new machine, which I have seen a picture of, hopefully will be in beta testing either late this year, early next year, and it will have the ability to send books wirelessly, but those with no internet or spotty internet will still be able to use the current cartridge-based system. Sure. So we're getting towards the end here. Um, how to sign up, you can use the old paper applications. If we were in person, I would have some to hand out, but that we're not in person. Um, <laughs> okay. if, you would, if you would like applications or even promotional materials, if you want to set up a display in your library, shoot me an email, gabe.kramer at nebraska.gov. Um, if you want to apply or have someone you know that wants to apply for service, online is probably the best way to apply. But if you want paper applications, I can send those to you. If you want to email me, give me your library's address. Or if you want, again, display materials, I have that stuff I can send to you also. And I'll mention too, while we're looking at this slide here, if you're talking, thinking oh, about um, yeah. going, you know, if at libraries are thinking about wanting to go to the website and do this, um, these slides will be available to you all afterwards with the recording of today's show too. So um, Gabe will get that to me. So don't try and scribble down all these URLs and oh, things. No, um, <laughs> no. <laughs> We'll, we'll get the, and the links are all from the website too, which is in the session description, but you'll have access to these slides well as information as well. Yeah. Yeah. So we do have questions while you're on here about, you know, um, who is eligible, how to apply, what are the requirements for being eligible? Um, I know you mentioned that briefly at the beginning, but um, 
how does the process work for people? Who yeah. So anyone that has, well, that is, that is blind, legally blind, or anyone that has a visual apparent impairment. Um, so that could be someone that just has low vision, but still has some sight there. There is a technical definition. It's like 20 over 200 with glasses or something like that. Um, I, I honestly can't remember what it is. It's on the application. Um, or someone that has a neurological disorder like dyslexia. Dyslexia is not technically a visual disorder. It is a neurological disorder. Mm -hmm. um, but they still um, qualify for the service. Or someone that has a physical handicap that does not allow them to read or use regular printed materials. The example I always give is someone that, you know, say a veteran that was in a war and lost an arm. You know, it's they can't really hold a book anymore. They qualify for our service. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't realize. I think about talking book and braille, oh, it's just for people who are blind and can't see. But that whole physical thing is a whole nother group of people that this would work for. Um, yeah. Yes. They may, yeah. And I think that's one thing that people don't, when, whenever I mention people, they're like, oh, really? That they, yes. And yeah, you can't, that's a, you, you can't do the traditional way of reading. Here's a way that you can, and you are totally eligible just because of that physical thing. Yeah. Your eyesight might be 2020, but there's other physical reasons why you can't hold the book, hold the magazine. Boom. You're eligible. That is correct. Um, and in fact, February of 21, the National Library Service, along with, I mean, it, it literally took an act of Congress. Um, they made it easier for people to use our service now. Um, prior to February of 21, if you were blind or visually impaired or has a, had a physical handicap, you could have uh, someone like an actual medical doctor or a uh, psychologist or even a librarian or a principal or a school teacher sign your application. But if you had a cognitive disorder, again, the, the best example is dyslexia, which is technically not a visual impairment. You could only use our service if a actual medical doctor signed your application. Mm -hmm. Now, those people that have those disorders can just have a principal or a school teacher or a librarian sign their application. Nice. Um, when it comes to librarians, I, I, I will say that, it, and I know I'm talking to librarians, that's the one group of people that we do scrutinize a, a little bit more than school teachers or of course doctors um when we get someone like that that is that is signed off on an application mm -hmm. um we we do we would prefer if the person that signs it actually has their li uh, master's in library science as mm -hmm. opposed to just uh someone that's working at your local library um that's not a necessity, it's not a requirement, but we just want to make sure that um, we don't get in trouble for having someone sign up for a service that doesn't technically qualify. That wasn't actually qualified, yeah. Yeah, and that's it's interesting that, um, you, you know, it's if it, it feels like this kind of thing would be, oh, you need a doctor to, uh, uh, you, know, you know, verify that, yes, this person has this particular, um, issue and that's why they are eligible and something we always teach librarians and try and tell them is if someone comes into your library wanting legal help or medical advice or something your first thing you've got to say to them is I am not a lawyer I am not a doctor I cannot do this for you I can refer you to the people who are though and I can get you the information you need to do that yourself but do not ask me for medical advice I will not give it do not ask me for legal advice but in this case they're they are one of the people and school teachers too who are allowed to sign off on these forms saying, yes, I do know this, basically, I know this person, yes, they do have this issue, is what you're, you know, um, certifying on the form. So yes. it's interesting to see the one different no. place where it's okay for you to ha be the one who is approving the fact that this person is eligible. Yep, that, that is absolutely correct, yes. Yeah. So any other questions?
Yeah, if anybody does have any other questions, I've been grabbing some of them, go ahead and type into the question section of your GoToWebinar interface. Um, as I said, I'm monitoring that here. If you have your own microphone, you can use that to ask your questions as well. Just uh, type that in. I have a microphone, unmute me, and we can do that. Um, but I do have a couple other questions here. Um, curious, how many patrons, and I don't know if did you mention this, how many do we do you have in Nebraska? On the, we in the currently program? have around 2,700 patrons statewide. Um, okay. That's great. I would say that's probably on the low end nationwide, um, but but of course we have a smaller population here in well, Nebraska. Like than as a whole, sure, sure, yeah. Um, nationwide, in the last decade, uh, patron count has dropped by about twenty five percent, and I think that has to do with a couple things. Number one, our average patron is an an 80 plus year old uh female so of course they're gonna eventually die sure um, and people because of medical advancements they're losing their sight later in life so we're not getting as many people at the young end of the spectrum either um and that's honestly one reason why the National Library Service made the change to make it easier for those with flight dyslexia to sign up for the service. Because that's not something that can as, as easily be necessarily like not affect people that, it, you know, once you have that, yeah, there's, you got to figure out how to work with it. And this is one way. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But it's also, also because uh, it's, it's a way to boost their patron count too. Yeah. Um, expanded to more people so um, also i wondered that more um audiobooks in general are becoming more popular just to everybody you know i think they are i don't personally like listening to audiobooks which is weird because of the position i'm in <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I agree i i've tried and someone i've learned someone reading to me is a great way to put me to sleep yes <laughs> Yes. And, well, I'm sorry. That. It's just not. Yeah. Uh, but I also I, I don't really like reading on a tablet either. I like holding that that physical book mm -hmm. in my hands. Mm -hmm. That's the yeah, that's thing to be both their preferences. I will read on anything. I'll read on a tablet. I'll read on reading a book. Not on my phone. That's too small right. <laughs> for an extended period of time. Um, but yeah, just the audio for myself. Yeah, but I know people love it. They listen to it for all different on the road when they're driving. Well, that'll be bad for me driving. I don't need to be put to sleep. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah. Um, so question about um, you were talking. Yeah, somebody has a question about what you record and what the national um, NLS records. Um, so they do more of the like you said the the popular titles, the bestsellers, and are are the states then just do the local type publish things how what's the how is that split up with what they do and what you do that's that's a really good question actually um yes the national library service focuses more on your popular national titles um i would say if a book hits the top 100 on the new york times bestseller list be it number one or, or number 100 even if it's for a week it's probably going to get recorded by nls mm -hmm. um the state, or now you'll get it from the publishers since then. Or you'll get it from the publishers, correct, right. yeah. The states, we we fill in the gaps. You get that local flavor. Um, here in Nebraska, our collection development policy for the uh, talking books is books by a Nebraska author. That's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two is books about Nebraska. Mm -hmm. Number three is books that take place in Nebraska. And then lastly is books that take place, you know, in the Great Plains. Um, we really focus on number one and number two. I prefer not to read uh, the third and fourth categories, although that's not to say we, we have not recorded those books, though. Um, but yeah, our books tend to be a little less popular, um, a little a more popular. local. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So then, 
you're recording things that are like, like you said, Nebraska centric. Uh, if are the things that so so, so I'm trying to figure out this answer this ask this question that yeah. Um, so Nebraska has talking book and braille service that is for Nebraska residents. Um, does every other state have every single state have one? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, well, al almost every state. Um, Wyoming and Alaska, I believe they co-op uh, with Utah. Okay. Um, Utah is kind of the, the big clearinghouse. Um, for example, our Braille patrons, um, not just the e-Braille users, but the physical Braille users get all their Braille from Utah. We just don't have the space to house Braille. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, the the seventh Harry Potter book is like 10 volumes in Braille. Braille? Oh my gosh. You literally wow. you would get yeah, those books are huge though. I get yeah. the yeah. Yeah. But <laughs> but you know, a, a typical adult novel, it might come delivered to you in a FedEx box instead of the USPS, just because it's so large. Mm -hmm. Um, so we just don't have the space for it. Um, Utah has like an airplane hangar full of Braille. <laughs> yeah, wow. Yeah. Uh, so if someone who is interested in the Nebraska titles that we have recorded, but they're like in New York, can how, can they get access to the things that Nebraska has recorded? How does yes. that work? Like like if someone so, moves Nebraska to New York and they want you know they still want to keep getting those same nebraska titles they used to get from here is there well can you lend yep. to other states? how does that all work we actually upload our local books to bard so you could download it to your phone but you could also if and actually i don't think new york has switched to duplication on demand yet um or or they're just kind of in the beginning stages of it <laughs> but any library that has switched to duplication on demand, um, those books and the duplication on demand computer, they're actually connected to the National Library Services servers in Washington, DC. Okay. So that's how we're, we don't store those audio files here in Nebraska. Mm -hmm. It's all done in, through a cloud-based system. So we upload our books to that cloud. Uh, okay. And, everyone has access to them then. okay so all the states upload their stuff that they record locally up into the big cloud and then yes. anyone can get it down from there nice okay yes or at least the vast majority of things that they record there are a couple states that have decided that they're going to be very picky about what they upload to the national website um a lot of it has to do with maybe the recordings aren't very good maybe they're old mm. um but but I would say 95% of all the materials are available nationwide. Okay. Um, and you could still interlibrary loan it also. Um, so if there's something in say Ohio that they have on physical cartridge but isn't on the cloud, oh, a Nebraska okay. patron, yeah. we could I I L L it from Ohio and just have it mm -hmm. sent that way. Okay, because other states are probably in the same situation as you mentioned here, where we still got a few people doing those yeah. cartridges or the old um, cassettes, just because. <laughs> and until those machines die, we're not gonna make them change. <laughs> correct, correct. Yeah. Um, sure. And we also um, can get uh, public, well, public or private schools signed up for our program, also. Um, not just the individual student. We can sign oh. up schools or nursing homes, for that matter. Nice. So not each individual person in the nursing home has to apply. The no. nursing home as a whole can do. The, the only thing the nursing home has to prove is that at least one person in that nursing home qualifies for the service. And usually there's at least one person in there that qualifies for the service. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And for the school, the same thing? If a school... uh, the schools, it's a little bit different. Um, you have to actually send us a list of the students' names and how many students. Okay. So at the beginning of, actually, it's better if we start with the end, the end of the school year. Um, we send a letter out to all the schools that 
had signed up for the service with a school account and they have to return all of their machines, all of their materials to us. Mm. Okay. Then in August, so I'll be sending out these letters probably around the first or second week of August. Any of the schools that the previous term had an account with us will send out a letter. Hey, do you still have students that need our service? If you do, please fill out, refill the application again with the students' names and I think their grade level, and we will send you the materials again. Uh, where nursing homes don't have to do that every year. That they, makes sense because schools, up, you know, kids graduate or they move up no. to another grade. They're not in the middle school anymore. They're in the high school. Correct. They move around. That makes sense. You want to make sure people, kids, the children are still where they were before. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So when it, when I talk to school teachers, I actually tell them that you're better off trying to get the individual student to sign up for the service mm -hmm. instead of the school. Um, because it tends to be easier as long as the student remembers to bring their machine with them every day to school. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's not hard to get kids to remember to do things, no. Right. Right. <laughs> because then the student just signs up for it once and so so individuals don't have to renew every year. They just sign up no. once and they're good for as long as they want to be for, doing For it. life, if right. they want. Yeah, they're good for life. Yeah. yeah. And, and like I said, that's the same with uh, your your uh, nursing homes and things like that too. You just do it once, great, yeah. yeah. And also, Key, I'll just mention this too that you mentioned at the very beginning. All of this is at no cost to anyone. No cost to anyone. Um, it doesn't cost to sign up for the service. It doesn't cost to use the service. It does not cost to mail things back and forth between your home and the library. Everything is prepaid. All, all covered, yep. Yep. So the only um, cost would be the time of doing it, yeah. Yep, yeah, that's the big thing I always like to stress because we don't have the collection that Audible has. Audible has a lot more books to choose from than we do. However, you have to pay for Audible. Mm -hmm. We are we are free. And let's be honest, we've got, I don't know, say 100,000 titles. In your lifetime, are you ever going to be able to read those titles? <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot, yeah. And like you said, all the bestsellers, all the ones that everybody is clamoring yeah. for when those new books, I mean, every week we hear the next James Patterson is coming. <laughs> that's right. And we even have a lot of like the autobiographies that um, have like, say, the author reading their own audiobook. A yeah. lot. I won't say all, but a lot of those we have those recordings with with the author reading their own book. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Um, and also another thing you have, which I think is really cool, and we didn't really get it much into, and I, I feel bad that we kind of didn't get to that yet because we're getting to the end of our hour. But that's okay. We'll just we'll keep going as long as anybody has any questions. Just ask your questions. We won't cut things off. Um, get them in so we can ask Gabe right now. Uh, your readers advisors that work with your patrons that keep track like you said we keep track they put in their list they want but you have a staff of people that actually talk to these patrons say, okay so what are you interested in and having that kind of personal concierge of your reading i mean <laughs> <laughs> yeah um we've got i i would say it's probably half to two-thirds of our patrons they call in at least once a month to order books or to refresh their request list mm -hmm. um, and talk to our staff we have three readers advisors and they're wonderful they really are the hardest working people in the talking <laughs> book service <laughs> uh -huh. um, they have a, a thankless job that i'm i couldn't do I, I mean, I just, I, I'm not made that way. I'm not built that way. <laughs> a lot of uh, customer service type yes, things. Yes, yes. Yeah. But they really get to know these patrons on a, on a personal level and know what they like, what they dislike. And they're really, they're able to fine tune that, that what they want. Um, but then we've got a yeah, small percentage, a probably skill. 15 to 20% of our patrons, we literally never hear from. They are self-sufficient. They read everything on their tablet or on their phone. Mm -hmm. And we never get an email, a phone call, nothing. <laughs> they just have access to it and on their device and they're good to go. <laughs> yep. 
That's correct. And we're just providing the connection, I guess, to get them yep. set up. Nice. All right. So I didn't see any other last minute desperate questions come in while we were chatting. That's cool. We're about at the end of our hour, though, so that's perfect timing. Yeah. And one, one thing I would like to reiterate before we go is, again, if, if you want any like display materials or promotional materials, feel free to email me and ask for stuff. Um, I have access to like posters that are that are on like poster stands or easels to postcards that you know someone can just put put in their back pocket um, and, and all kinds of stuff in between. If you if that's something you would like in your library, yes, we can send you all those things so you can promote it and get people signed up. Absolutely. And since it's just you promoting it, you don't have to handle the signing up and mailing of things at the library you just connect the people who need it to our correct company. um and our promotional materials they will either have the national website on there or our local website on there and some of them have both um, if you go to our local website you can fill out the application directly online if you go to the national website you can fill out the application online and then that will get eventually will find its way to Nebraska. There's also, you can call us or you can call the 1-800 number to the National Library Service and they'll send you to Nebraska as well. They'll direct you to the right state of wherever you are. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. All right, then. Awesome. Thank you so much, Gabe. I'm glad we were able to get you on to talk about this. It's been a few years since we've had anything on Encompass Live about our TBBS here. So. Well, I know I wasn't director then. <laughs> no, yes, yeah, it was directorship time. <laughs> Um, but you know, lots of things have changed. And then when you started at the beginning of this, I was like, yeah, there's been so many things are so different from when I first came here to the commission to what is or is how it's run now. Um, it's cool to see the the history of it. A lot of things I did not know about how it all started and everything way back in the beginning with all the old our vinyl. Vinyl is becoming popular again in music. I don't think it will be back popular in this. <laughs> no, and, and in fact, um, it, it was terrible because they would come back all scratched up, and yeah. it it just was was awful. But not the best. That, that's what that's what they had at the time. That's so. what was real, absolutely. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> all right. So I am going to pull presenter control back to my screen now. Sure. To to um, wrap things up for today. There we go. So yeah, thanks so much, Gabe. This was great. I'm glad we got all this information out there for people, what's going on right now. And hopefully we'll have you on sooner again, uh, again um, sometimes when things change again. <laughs> um, as I said, the um, recording will be available. Uh, we're recording right now. Uh, we'll get posted to our Library Commission's YouTube channel. Everyone who attended today and registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know when it's available. Um, I'll have the slides as, uh, I'll be, uh, available as well. Um, Gabe, you can get those to me um, anytime today. Um, it usually takes me until like the next day tomorrow to get everything up and processed. So uh, this is the session page for today's show. Um, has a link to the TBBS website to where lots of the links were um, as well. Uh, on our main Encompass Live page here, um, if you just use your search engine of choice and type in Encompass Live, the name of our show, it's the only thing called that on the internet. Nobody else is allowed to use that name. Um, you'll get to this main page for us. Um, we've got our upcoming shows, and here's where our archives are. There's a link right underneath the list of upcoming shows. Uh, the most recent ones at the top of the list here. So this is last week's show. Um, today's will be up here by the end of the day tomorrow. Um, everything should be ready and processed. You'll get the email from me. Uh, we also push it out into our various social media. We have a Facebook page for Encompass Live. If you like to use Facebook, give us a like over there. See the reminders. She's a reminder about today's show, a little intro, um, meet our presenter who is presenting. And when our recordings are available, we post on here. So um, you can keep an eye on us there. Uh, we also use the hashtag NCUMP Live, a little abbreviation of our show name on uh, Instagram and Twitter to push out this information as well. So whichever type of social media you like, or just check our face, our page here. Uh, we also will put out emails on our mailing lists here um, through the Library Commission as well. Um, 
while we're here on the archive page, I'll show you there is a search feature. You can search our show archives to see if there's anything, any other shows of any, any topics you want to watch. Um, you can search the full archives, just the most recent 12 months if you want something just current. Um, that is because this is our full show archives, and I'm not going to scroll all the way back because that this is a very long, long page. Uh, going back to January 2009, that is when uh, Encompass Light premiered, and we have all of our show recordings here. Um, and we will always have them here. Um, we're librarians this is the one thing we do, keep things for historical purposes, keep them available out there. And as long as we have somewhere to put them, right now they're all on the commission's YouTube channel, we'll always have them available. So if you are watching any of our old archives, just do pay attention to the original broadcast dates. Everything has a date when it first was done as a live show. Um, some of the information in, in our old shows will be will still be good and valid and stand the test of time. Some things will become old and outdated and information may no longer be correct. Uh, services and products may have changed drastically. Some things may no longer exist anymore. Uh, so just do pay attention to that. But like I said, for historical purposes and archival purposes, we will always keep these all available. Uh, so that wraps up for today's show. Um, and here's our upcoming schedule for July and August. I've got more August, September dates you'll see getting filled in here. Um, so I hope you join us next week when our topic is a learning opportunities and resources from Web Junction. Web Junction is a great um, website for librarians to learn um, about very, all sorts of things. It's free on-demand courses, webinars. And uh, Kendra Morgan from Web Junction, she's been with us on the show many, many times over the years, um, will be with us to talk about um, what things you can learn at Web Junction. So uh, please do join us for that, any of our other shows. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you for being here with me this morning, Gabe. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and hopefully we'll see you all on a future episode of Encompass Live. Bye-bye. There we go. And I recorded.